Happy Easter, everybody. So a second ago, Pastor Kelly asked, hey, what's your favorite show that you love to binge? Just for a second, think about like your favorite TV show, the thing, that, I'm only bringing it up because there's one that I binge that Kelly and I, we wait for it to come out every, the new season comes out, we're like so excited about it. Uh, anybody ever watch uh, Somebody Feed Phil? So if you haven't watched it, it's a documentary uh, that is, this, they're in like their sixth or seventh season. And it's a travel show. And I, I used to love Anthony Bourdain and travel shows. And so uh, when he passed away, then I needed a new one. And so the creator, the writer from uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, then got a brand new show called Somebody Feed Phil. And you can tell by the name of the title that what's he gonna do, he's gonna eat. And so Phil travels the world and you just watch as he goes to new environments and new areas, and he's kind of this tourist, and it's just kind of fun to watch. And then he's kind of this little timid man, and everything is like, I don't really know, and he's kind of just like, eh, and he's got misconceptions, and I don't know. And then they, and he just tries stuff, and in fact, he's so timid. I, I have a screenshot from the show that I just thought was awesome. This is him <laughs> debating whether or not to eat this sandwich. And he's just, He's just one of those guys that has, his facial expressions are so wonderful that the show's just happy. Because after he takes a bite, check it out. Check it out. This, this is the next thing that happens. <laughs> this is Phil. If you've never watched the show, it's great. Because he's like, all the time, every time something good happens, he's, he just has the best facial expressions. And he's like he's jumping, he's dancing, and he's so excited because his misconceptions get blown up. When a misconception gets blown up, all of a sudden you can have joy if you realize, oh, this was really a good thing, and I thought it was a crappy thing. I think this is really true in Christianity. I think a lot of people have all kinds of misconceptions about Christ, about faith, about religion, about God. In fact, so did I for a really long time. So I'm just, this is some of the stuff that I think is natural. Put that on the screen for me. This is just, I think this is normal for people to think about, when they think about religion, they think, ah, oh, you know, it's, religion's just boring, it's irrelevant, it's just a myth, I'll, maybe I'll come to a service if I have to, if somebody will bribe me, but I don't, I don't really like this stuff. It's just a bunch of rituals, it's just rules. If God's really real, I hear this a lot from people, if God's really real, he's just mad at me. And the list can just go on and on and on. Everybody's got their own list of their misconceptions about God or about faith. And it's like, I, I, wanna, I wanna bite the sandwich, but man, it looks a little creepy. I'm not really sure if it's gonna be worth it. Is it really gonna benefit me? Is this really gonna matter in my life? And then what Jesus is hoping is that he will chase you down enough and keep running after you and after you and after you and going, I am gooder than you think. Look at the person next to you and say, Jesus is gooder than you think. He is gooder. Than, he's just like, hey, I know you got some misconceptions. If you go over that list with me, man, I, I grew up in the church world. By the time I was 14, I was running as far from God as I possibly could. I was like, heck to the no. I want nothing to do with this. Run in the other direction, angry with God, angry. If God existed at all, I thought God was a jerk. Like I, wanted, I just had so many misconceptions. And Jesus just would not leave me alone. He just kept chasing after me and chasing after me. And eventually I realized, oh man, he's so much better than I ever thought. And when this hit me, I went from depression to joy. I went from an angry jerk of a kid, and I was, to a lot less dysfunctional. <laughs> See, I'm being honest. A lot less dysfunctional. I had a... I had a something to hold on to in the midst of circumstances that are pretty crappy. And if you think about the average person, what do you have to hold on to in the middle, middle of bad circumstances? You just drink more. How's that helping? How's it working for you? Oh, I'm just drunk more. Great. And how are you handling the bad job and the rough marriage and the dysfunctional children and the go on and on and on and on and on and on. I'll just drink more, I'll just numb more, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just. And Jesus is like, I'm not mad at you for any of that. I just wanna tell you, I'm better than all of this stuff. Come on, say he's gooder than you think. And what's amazing is, and I made, I made some of you like that are English nerds are freaking out, no, you can't say gooder. <laughs> I'm doing it to you on purpose to mess you up. You'll be fine. <sighs> the text we're gonna look at today is Jesus right after his resurrection and his disciples have some major misconceptions about him. 
and he goes and chases them down. And he basically goes, hey, I'm, I'm gooder than you think. I'm better than you thought. I'm greater than you could have imagined. And so we're just going to read through this text, and I want, I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to be one of those disciples that's really debating whether or not God's good. Maybe you're in here today, like, I'm not sure I buy this God gig, and you're kind of kicking the tires of faith, and you see the, the old used Christian car, and you're like, do I want to buy this product? I don't really know. Some people tell me it's great, but I can't see what's so great about this old thing from 2,000 years ago. And let's just read the text, and you be a disciple for a minute with all your misconceptions, and it's okay. It's okay to have some doubts and some concerns and to, to not sure if this is really gonna help. I think that's fair. Well, let's just read the text and see what Jesus would say. And let's pray and we'll do it. Lord Jesus, thank you for every life in here. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that 2,000 years ago, you really did rise from the grave. Thank you that every disciple gave their life claiming to have seen you alive under torture. They said they saw you alive. They gave their lives because they know you really resurrected from the dead. So I pray right now that you would just sit down next to every person with all of their discouragement and all of their misconceptions and all of their confusion and all of their anger and all of their doubt, and you would tell them that they are loved in spite of it all and that you're good or than we could have ever imagined. Everybody, everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. So this, like I said, this text that we're about ready to read is Jesus right after his resurrection. In fact, it's his very first time he gets to preach a sermon after he rises from the dead. And here's how this starts. This is Luke 24, verses 13. It says, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus. This is right after... Um, Christ's resurrection, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. Well, what had just happened? Jesus had died and they witnessed a murder. Imagine how traumatized you'd be having witnessed the murder of a friend. They have witnessed his murder. They're, they're talking about it. They're discouraged because he's dead. And as they walked and talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began to walk with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. And I'm just going to stop for a second because sometimes it's really hard to recognize God. Sometimes it's really hard to recognize that he's good. Sometimes because life is painful like it was for these guys. Whenever painful things happen, discouraging things happen, circumstances that are confusing and unknowable, and you never expected this to happen in life, and you thought life was supposed to be so much better, and then you got ripped off, and they couldn't see God anymore. They couldn't see this friend that they said they knew. They could not recognize him at all. So don't feel bad if you have misconceptions about faith. So did the disciples. Man, if you witnessed the murder of your friend, you'd have some misconceptions about God too. God, if you're really good, why'd you let my best friend get murdered? I don't really understand how you can be good and I just witnessed all this. This isn't fair. I don't understand this. This is crazy. You can see how their mind's gonna get a little clouded to missing Jesus. Pain in life has a way of disguising God from us. And so they don't see him, and then he asks them, he said, what are you discussing so intently as you're walking along? And they stop short, sadness written all over their faces, and one of them, Clopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that has happened these last few days. Well, what things, Jesus said? The things that happened to Jesus, the man of the man from Nazareth, they said he was a prophet who did a powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We were hoping he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel and this all just happened three days ago. We watched him butchered, man. Now I gotta stop for a second because they got some major misconceptions about Jesus. They called him a good man in the text. They called him a prophet, they called him a miracle worker, and they called him a mighty teacher. But if that all is all Jesus is, he can't save you from your sins and you're on your own hopeless. Lots of good people out there, they can't, your mom was a nice person, she can't save you from your sins. Good teachers can't save you. 
Good prophets can't save you. Even some miracle workers can't save you. And they don't recognize, they have some misconceptions about who he is, that he's bigger and greater than they ever thought. He's so much bigger than just, so I heard uh, C.S. Lewis one time say that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. He claimed to be God. He's either a liar and he lied to us all, which would make him more evil than Hitler because more people have died in the name of Jesus than any killer ever killed. Can't be just a good guy if he lied to you. Liar, lunatic. Well, maybe he was nuts. Like nuts people go like, I'm God, I'm God, that's who I am. No, you're nuts. And if Jesus was nuts, that doesn't make him worthy of worship. So you only have three options. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's more than just a good man and a good teacher. Maybe he's, maybe he's gooder than you think. You still with me? Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. We just sent some ladies down there to make sure that there were flowers on the tomb and everything was cool. And they came back with a weird report. They were like, his body's missing, and they saw some angels. How crazy is that? Who told them Jesus was alive, and some of our, our men ran to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women said. And then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things, that there was gonna be pain before a payoff? That there was gonna have to be some hurt and some brokenness before some resurrection on the other side? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah was gonna suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses, that's the Old Testament. And he took them through the prophets, the second half of the Old Testament. And he explained to them all the scriptures the things concerning, what's the last word there? Do you know what he just said? Jesus' first sermon after rising from the dead was, I'm better than you think. Every single word in this book is really not about Moses or David or Goliath or Abraham or Adam and Eve. Every single word in this whole book is really just about me. Jesus' first sermon was trying to blow up their perception of faith and God and religion and say, don't you know, scrap all that other stuff. Everything's really about me. It's all about Jesus. In fact, you sang about it. The third song you sang was basically this statement we're putting on the screen. From Genesis to Revelation, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. In fact, if you read the scriptures, you will find the entire Old Testament saying, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. For 6,000 years, the, the Old Testament shouts, Jesus is coming. The New Testament, the whole second half of the Bible goes, Jesus came, Jesus came, Jesus came. Whatever you do, what will you do with Jesus? Because he's the center and source and life of everything. Old Testament points to Jesus. New Testament points to Jesus. Every story points to Jesus. Every prophecy points to Jesus. Every, everything's about Christ. Do you know in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, that very last book of the Bible, Jesus says this, or John says this about him. It says his name is the word of God. This is important because now we'll talk about misconceptions about scripture. I know a lot of you have misconceptions about the Bible, but you like the idea of Jesus. This is one and the same. His name is the word of God. His name is the word of God. This book in its entirety, instead of calling it the Bible, you could just call it Jesus. To mock, to doubt. It's like, ah, I don't buy it. That's stupid. That old dusty book is worthless. You just call Jesus worthless. Jesus is the word of God. Come on, say Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. He's trying to get you to see something greater this Easter. He's trying to get you to understand that the, this, this, this is not a dusty old book, that the words themselves, this is Jesus to you until he physically splits the sky and shows back up again. And he's wait, he's wait, it's almost like he's going, hello, open this up. I love you. <laughs> 
Come on, say Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you an acronym this year on Easter for the word word for a second. First of all, word means worthy of worship. Everybody say worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. Just think for a second about the things humans worship. Now, some of you are going, I don't worship nothing, really. Whatever you live for is what you really worship. I'll put a bunch of stuff on the screen just for a second. We all worship something. What's the thing that you worship most? What's the thing that you are truly living for? What do you have to have? And if you don't have it, you're just going to lose your mind. I have to have this. I have to have success. I have to have sex. I have to have the girlfriend. I got to stay married. I got to stay married. I got to stay, I got to stay sober. I got to stay sober. I got to stay sober. Or I got to use. I got to use. I got to use. I got to use. I got to, I just need a little more money, a little more money, a little more money, a little more, just another weekend, just another weekend. If I can have the weekend, if I can have the weekend, if I can have the weekend, if I have the weekend. I'm not blowing smoke. Everybody in this room, you have something that is of chief value to you that if you don't have it, oh, you might not lose your mind on the outside, but inside you're losing your <laughs> Right? Yes or no? Oh, yeah, it's what you worship. It's what you have to have. It's what is the most valuable to you. Now, I'm going to say something about this. Pleasure's not bad, and money's not bad, and kids are definitely not bad, and sports aren't bad, and fame isn't bad, and success isn't bad. Girlfriend, <laughs> none of this stuff's bad. But none of this stuff died for you. So you get to choose what you will worship, but only one person physically died for you. In fact, this is Revelation 5, verse 14. It says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. There is no greater thing to worship and any lesser thing that we worship will make you dysfunctional. You worship a girlfriend or boyfriend long enough and they will disappoint you. You worship the weekend long enough and you'll be so stressed out because you didn't get enough time off. You worship pleasure, you'll end up an alcoholic. You worship fun, and you end up a fool. See, every other thing that you could ever worship will cause you dysfunction and pain. But that guy on that cross, he only elevates. When a person worships, the one on the cross, everything in your life is elevated rather than destroyed. He, it's never a bait and switch. It's never he might help. He always helps. He is faithful. He's steadfast. He's never going to quit on you. He's always going to love you. He is the only thing worthy of our worship. He is the word. Well, what's the O stand for? Only God. There is no other God. In one place he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, I'm, it's exclusive. Muhammad can't save you. Muhammad's in hell. Oh, you can't say things like that. No, that's where he is. He didn't worship Jesus. Buddha can't save you. Oh, well, just, he's the, well, just throw this on the screen for me. I just, I just, I can't help it. So up here I've got... Buddha's grave, dude is dead. Probably ought not worship a dead dude. I got Buddha's grave, Muhammad's grave. Oh, I threw Joseph Smith in for all the Mormons. <laughs> By the way, he died in a gun battle shooting two guards. But started Mormonism. Oh, but I know another tomb. Let me show you this one. There's no dead guy in this one. There's no dead guy in this one. See, the resurrection is the evidence that he is actually God. If somebody can resurrect themselves from death, it would mean they are God because they can conquer what nobody else could ever conquer. So there's this story where a dude's got some misconceptions again. It's this guy named Thomas. He's one of the disciples. And 
He hears that Jesus rose from the dead, and he's like, oh, yeah, so there's an empty tomb. Woo! And uh, he says, unless I see the nail scars and I put my hand in the side, I will not believe. And Scripture says about a week goes by, and he's like, I, I don't buy it. Somebody just probably took the body. And then Jesus appears to him. This is John 20, verse 27. It says, then he said to Thomas, don't you reach your finger here. And he showed him his hands. Look at my, my hand here and, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving anymore. Stop with the misconceptions, but believe. He took time to answer Thomas's misconceptions. He wasn't mad at Thomas. He wasn't like, what you making me do this for? Don't you know I'm trying to run the world? And he just shows up and says, look, 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 here's the hands. Really rough. Here's the side. Really alive. And Thomas, when his misconception gets blown up, check out what he says. He doesn't call him a good teacher. He doesn't call him the prophet. He doesn't call him a nice guy. He says, my Lord and my what? See, the evidence that he's God is he punched the Grim Reaper in the throat and walked out of a tomb alive. Muhammad didn't do that. Dude is dead. Neither did Buddha. Neither did Joseph Smith, but Jesus did. It's why he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because why? Because I beat up death. Anybody else do that? I didn't think so. I'm it. Worthy of worship. Only God. Our restorer of our relationship with God. Or our friendship with God. I've been trying to say it this whole service, but I'm going to say it again. God's not mad at you. He's mad about you. God's not a God of rules, which was the misconception I always had. I thought God was this guy in the sky with a bat. If you step out of line, he was going to whack you good. And I wanted nothing to do with that kind of God. And then somebody blew up my misconception and told me that God was a God of relationship and not a God of rules, that he wanted to walk with me and talk with me, and he wanted to help me with my life, and he wanted to help me. He wanted, he cared about me. And it just, my mind was like... How could you want to care about me? And the visual I like to use is just this idea that humans and God are supposed to be in relationship. It's why everybody has to wrestle with the question, does God exist? Because you were supposed to be in, nobody has never asked that question. Because you were supposed to be in relationship with God. There's something inside of you that cries to figure out, is God real? Who is God? What's he like? Everybody wonders this stuff. But the truth is, is that sin, our own mistakes, separated us from a holy God. And we feel the separation so that we wonder, is he real? Is he truth? Does he exist? Does he care? And Jesus answers all of these questions with the cross. He says, oh, he cares. He cares so much, I will die for every one of your mistakes. Oh, he cares. I will come to earth and live as a human just like you to tell you that you're loved and that you're cared for. This cross is a bridge connecting you back to God, but you gotta decide to walk across it. He is the restorer of relationship, but you have to go to him. He already built the bridge. He's just waiting for you to cross. Romans 5, 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul writes it like this, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. We can rejoice in this wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God's gooder than you think. Jesus restored you to relationship. He restores you to friendship. He restores you to connection. A lot of people are like, eh, me and God are good. I would say, if you don't hear God talk to you on a daily basis, and you don't open up the scriptures and hear God speak, and it's more like you have made a treaty with God. You stay on your side of the deal, and I'll stay on mine, and we're all good. But God wants to interact with you every day. 
He wants relationship with you all the time. And this is what Jesus does. Scripture calls him the mediator between God and man. He is the, the link. He is the connecting point. It is why you need Jesus. Not to know about Jesus, but to actually surrender your life to Jesus. It's one thing to know about Jesus. By the way, the devil knows about Jesus, not doing him any good. It's another thing to surrender your life to Jesus, to walk across that bridge and reconnect with a holy God through the cross of Christ, which leads me to the last letter, which is D. He is the deliverer from sin and death, and most importantly, hell. And I know some of you have spent, like, well, you know what? I just don't believe in hell. I can't believe in hell. Why would a good God send anyone to hell? And by the way, I'll just start with this. God did not make hell for humans. He made, scripture says he made it for the devil and his angels. He didn't make it for you. He made it for the devil and his angels. But if you don't want him, he had no place else to send you. You know, I don't buy it. I don't want to be with you. I don't like you. I would rather do my own deal. We're going to two places, heaven and hell. You don't want to be with me. I, I don't know what to do with you. God did not make hell for humans. He made it for the devil and his angels. But humans are so anti-Jesus, they would rather have hell than surrender to Christ. Now, we'll even take it further. I just don't believe, I can't believe that hell would exist. Like eternal, like damnation, that just doesn't seem fair. Well, I'm going to show you a picture. If hell is not real, why did Jesus have to do this? Well, maybe he didn't. Well, that would make him a fool again. That'd make him a moron if there was no hell and he had to go through this for you. The greatest evidence for hell is right there. The perfect one butchered for our mistakes, for our guilt, for our shame. The evidence for hell is what hangs on the cross. And you can either see love in this person who has died for you or you can see a fool but there's nothing in between there's just nothing else this is what Jesus said he said this in John 3 17 and 18 he said for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world God's not mad at you I just told you that but that the world through him might be rescued or saved. He who believes in him or walks across that bridge of the cross will never be, not, they're not gonna be condemned. And it doesn't make a difference what you've done, how you acted, where you've been, who you've slept with, how drunk you've been. It does not matter your past. If you trust Christ, if you give your heart to Christ, if you surrender to him, you are automatically rescued. Your sin is not greater than God's love. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Oh, wow, that took a negative turn quick. Well, why? Because he flipped off the one who sacrificed everything for you because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You either consider him a fool or you consider him Lord of all. But this Lord loves you. He died for you. Romans 10 verse 9 says it even better. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is a promise. Confession with our mouth. Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my God. There is no other Well, how does that work? Acts 2.38, Peter preached it like this. He said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to run to the baptism thing. I want you to see the first word, repent. It's repent of running the wrong way, doing your own thing, thinking God doesn't matter. It's about blowing up all your misconceptions and going, no, no, maybe God is good. Maybe God, is, maybe God could help. Maybe God could help. Maybe God, maybe God. You're just turning around. Repentance is turning around. It's to turn, to change your mind, to go the other direction. 
me at 17. My misconception. God was the guy in the sky with the bat and all he cared about was rules. And somebody said, that's not who he is. He loves you. He wants relationship with you. And I repented that night. I, I literally did get on my knees at a campfire. And I said, God, if it's, you're really real and you really are gonna care about me, I, I would worship and follow a Jesus like that. And he rescued me from sin, Satan, and death. He set me on a new path. He has elevated my life. He moved me forward in ways that drinking could not. And using a little more, or just playing some more video games, or just trying to get a little more money is never gonna elevate my life. But Jesus did. What will you worship this Easter? Who will you worship? He is the word. He is gooder than you think. Let's just invite you to close your eyes and bow your head for just a second. I want you to think about who you worship right now. Is it Christ or is it something else? God put you in this room tonight for this message. It was not an accident that you were here. He's been chasing after you your whole life to tell you that you're loved, that he's gooder than you think, that he could change you if you just give him your life. And it's just a simple declaration of faith. Scripture says if you confess with your mouth, so it's just out loud, you pray and receive Christ. I'm gonna lead us in a simple prayer. I'm just gonna lead us in a simple prayer. It's not a magic prayer, but if this prayer comes from the depth of your heart, Scripture says you will be saved. He will rescue you and put you back in relationship with himself. So at the count of three, we're just gonna pray out loud. One, two, three, everybody say, Jesus Christ. Tonight I give you my life. I believe you are the only God. You're my Savior and Lord. I want to be with you in friendship. Take me to my destiny and walk with me now. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's what I believe. I believe that some of you for the first time are kind of being reshaken up again with faith. I don't want you to let this moment go untapped. Because now I do want you to see that last verse again. Put that verse back, back up one more time. Repent is what we just did and prayed. And then it says, and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now what's the baptism part about? The, ba the baptism part about is, is the resurrection of Jesus. Baptism is I'm dying to my old life. I go down underneath the water and I'm dead and gone. The old me is over. It is done. It is done. I don't, I'm not that person anymore. I come up from the water to say, I follow Christ. I'm a new person. I'm a new person. I follow Jesus. So maybe you hear this whole message and the repentance part made a lot of sense to you and now you like never really thought about the baptism part. Well, I've been praying about it for you for this whole weekend. In fact, we've got a tank out there with chlorinated water. It's, it's heated. I've got shorts, shirts, towels, and I got a pastor right here that would happily bat. Can you stand up, Pastor Lyles? So when service is over in just a minute and everybody's walking out and like they're gonna go get their kids and all this, like I know you did not plan, some of you did not plan on being baptized tonight. I planned for you to get baptized anyway. God on behalf of heaven was like, hey, tell them, tell them, that if they've never been baptized, to consider baptism tonight. And so we are, we are ready to go. If you'd like to be baptized, you come see Pastor Silas as soon as the service is over. He's just gonna uh, take you off to the side, make sure you know what's going on in, ter in terms of baptism, and then we're gonna, we're gonna get you changed. We'll take you into that water, and we will put you under dying to the old and coming back resurrected and new. What a great way to spend Easter weekend, to get resurrected in newness of life, to say, I'm not the guy I used to be, I'm going on to better things. Would that be a good way to spend Easter weekend? So if that's you, you come see Pastor Silas as soon as service is over. I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet. Next week, we're going back to our conversation about the Bible cover to cover. And we're just gonna go to the next book of scripture. We're just working our way through the Bible about how every book is about Jesus. I hope you come back next week. We're just gonna end with our final blessing. Say this out loud with me. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. Happy Easter, everybody. I love you.